All right, uh, welcome to the uh, online causal inference seminar. Today, we're excited to have Chang Sheng Shi from uh, LSE, who will talk uh, about a reinforcement learning framework for dynamic causal effects evaluation in A-B testing. Um, uh, you will take questions, so please submit your questions in Q&A. Uh, after the talk, we'll have a discussion by Will Ways soon from Purdue University. We're very much looking for today's uh, talks. Uh, questions today will be hang handled by Ying, so I'm quickly handing over to her. Thanks, Dominic. So uh, please submit your questions uh, using the Q&A section. If you haven't used it before, it is just behind the, uh, uh, the Zoom window. There is a Q&A uh, &A button and please submit the questions there instead of the chat so that we can track the questions better. Um, and that's it. Um, I'll uh, give the stage to Chen Chen. Uh, thanks, Ying, Dominic, and Guido uh, for uh, the very uh, for the kind of invitation and a uh, uh, very nice introduction. And uh, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming to my talk. Uh, it is a really a uh, great honor for me to give a talk here at this online causal inference seminar. And in today's talk, I would like to uh, discuss some of my recent research projects where we introduce a reinforcement learning framework for dynamic causal effects evaluation. Uh, to be honest, I'm not an expert in causal inference, uh, but I do know that causal inference is very popular uh, nowadays and it is becoming more and more popular. And uh, so just as a warm up, I guess everyone uh, in this seminar know that uh, uh, the last year's uh, Nobel Prize in economics is awarded uh, to uh, Gido, uh, David and Joshua for their excellent work and co on causality and the natural experiments. And the causal inference has been widely applied uh, in, in practices. It has been applied to a wide range of applications, so including uh, economics, healthcare, and uh, it, it is also being uh, widely used in technological companies, including those e-commerce platforms uh, such as Amazon. And it also has been uh, applied in rata sharing. And in today's talk, we will mainly focus on applications in rata sharing. And to our knowledge, this is kind of like a next explored application in the current causal inference literature. So uh, now uh, when it comes from uh, ride sharing, uh, you can think about large ride sharing companies such as Uber or Lyft, where they have a group of drivers that operate in a taxi-like fashion. And I have also been uh, collaborated with a particular ride sharing company. And for that company, it has like over five 100 million many users. And the vehicle trajectory data that they have is over 100 terabytes. So that's the data that they have for one day. So those companies, they really have a huge database and the richness of the data in those companies provide us statisticians with unique opportunities to conduct data-driven statistical analysis. And here, I list some of the questions that are of the company's interest. So firstly, uh, the company is interested in the problem of supply demand forecasting. So uh, at uh, a certain time point in the future, in a particular location, what is the estimated number of call orders in that location? And uh, what is the estimated number of drivers in that uh, uh, location? So that corresponds to the problem of supply demand forecasting. And secondly, a policy evaluation. So based on the data that the, the company have, how can we evaluate the performance of a given policy? And finally, a policy optimization. So how can we derive an optimal policy based on the observed data to maximize the company's long-term object, long objective? And solving these questions require knowledges from experimental design, spatial temporal modeling, deep reinforcement learning, and the graphical modeling. And these questions, they are at the intersections of statistics, computer science, operational research, and machine learning. Now the research projects that I'm going to talk about today are motivated by the applications in rather sharing. And in particular, uh, in the first project, I would like to uh, talk about one of my research work where we introduce a reinforcement learning framework 
uh, for solving uh, the A-B testing problem in those ridership sharing companies. And uh, actually, uh, we finished uh, writing up this paper two years ago, and uh, it has been recently accepted in JASA last year. So in this project, uh, we focus on uh, considering the A-B testing problem. And uh, nowadays, A-B testing uh, kind of, uh, is very popular, and it has become like a golden standard for the technological companies to compare two versions of the products. And typically what those companies will do is that they will uh, randomize the visitors into two different subgroups. And for each subgroup, uh, they will assign a particular version of the policy. And then uh, they collect the data and estimate what is the uh, average reward, what is the estimate average outcome uh, for those uh, subpopulation. And finally, uh, they conduct a two sample t test to compare uh, to, to test like whether the new policy is significantly better compared to the old policy or not. And uh, our board project is motivated uh, by considering the order dispatching problem in uh, those rather sharing companies. And basically uh, those order dispatching problem, uh, they can be considered like one of the most fundamental problem in those uh, rather sharing companies. And the problem can be formulated as follows. So at each time point, we will have a list of the call orders. And we also have a list of the available drivers. So essentially, for each of the call order in the list, which driver should we ask to pick up that particular call order? So that corresponds to uh, the order dispatching problem. And based on the definition, uh, you can see that uh, uh, this is like uh, one of the most basic, but uh, one of the most important problem in the ride sharing company. And our project is motivated by the need for comparing the long-term rewards of two on order dispatching policies in ride sharing companies. And before presenting our methodology, I just want to uh, first uh, give you uh, a summary of how the data collected from those companies look like. So in order to evaluate uh, two different order dispatching policies, uh, the company typically conduct a random experiment to, to compare those two policies. And the experiment usually lasts for two weeks. And typically uh, they will use uh, one 30, 30 minutes or one hour as a time unit. So every uh, 30 minutes or every hour, uh, it will assign a new policy. It will uh, implement a, a new uh, treatment. And the observed data consists of some of the uh, time varying variables. So including uh, the number of drivers and the number of uh, uh, the, the number of passengers, the number of call orders in this time unit. And these two variables, uh, they usually have huge impact on the company's outcome. And uh, they can be viewed as like the supply and the demand of this two-sided uh, ride sharing platform. And the treatment uh, being considered is binary. Uh, so essentially we want to compare a new policy against an old version of the policy. And, and for those companies, they typically adopt a so-called alternating time interval design or the switchback design, which can be described as follows. So at a particular time point, it will use an old policy. And then in the next time point, it will uh, adopt a new policy. And then uh, it will switch back to an old policy, so on and so forth. And finally, um, the company uh, also uh, consider like uh, uh, have, have different types of outcomes. So the first type of outcome corresponds to the answer rate which is essentially the percentage of call orders being responded by the drivers. And the second one corresponds to a completion rate, which is a percentage of call orders being completed. So these two outcomes, these two outcomes, uh, they measure the customer satisf satisfaction rate uh, with respect to the company. And in addition to these two outcomes, we can also consider uh, the driver income.
Now, there are a few challenges uh, for solving the A-B testing problems uh, in those ride sharing companies. And in particular, the first the challenge is due to the existence of the carryover effects. So in the next slide, I will discuss in detail why the carryover effect exists in our ride sharing applications. And in particular, under uh, this alternating time interval design and due to the existence of the carryover effects, it turns out that the past actions will affect the future outcomes. And so, so it is very important that uh, in order to develop a valid A-B testing procedure, we should take the carryover effects into consideration. And unfortunately today, uh, most of the, of the existing A-B testing procedure, they might fail to detect the carryover effect. And the second challenge comes from the need for early termination. And this is essentially uh, because each experiment will take a considerably long time. And early termination is very important in order to save the time as well as the budget. And finally, uh, the last challenge comes from the need for adaptive randomization. And this is because sometimes the company also would like to uh, randomize the treatment adaptively uh, in order to uh, maximize the total reward or in order to detect the alternative hypothesis faster. And to our knowledge, no existing test has simultaneously addressed all these three challenges. Now, uh, in the next few slides, I just want to uh, give you a very simple toy example to illustrate why those carryover effects exist in our ride sharing applications. Now, uh, at this time point, uh, we have three drivers here in zone number three. And we have another uh, driver in zone number 10 and a passenger in zone number six. So at this particular time point, we can consider uh, two different actions. So we can either ask one of the driver in zone number three to pick up this passenger. Or alternatively, we can ask the driver in zone number 10 to pick up this passenger. Now, suppose we use the closest driver policy uh, so we ask one of the driver in zone number three to pick up this passenger. And because of that, we will only have two drivers in zone number three. Now, suppose sometime later, uh, we receive three call orders in zone number one. Then in that case, of course, we can ask two of the drivers in zone number three to pick up two of the passengers here. And uh, uh, we can also ask one of the driver in zone number 10 to pick up the remaining passenger. But due to that, zone number 10 is very far away from zone number one. So it might take a very long time for the driver uh, in zone number 10 to pick up this passenger. And because of that, so the passenger might refuse to wait and cancel the order. So in that case, we will miss one order in the future. Now, suppose uh, if we consider a different action at that time point. So instead of asking one of the drivers in zone number three to pick up this passenger, we directly ask the, passing, uh, the driver in zone number 10 to pick up this passenger. So this helps to save all the three drivers in zone number three. So that sometime later in the future, when those three call orders appear in zone number one, we are able to match all these three orders. So this is just an illustration of why uh, carryover effects exist uh, in our red sharing uh, applications. And uh, essentially those carryover effects, uh, they refer to the effect of the past actions on the future rewards, on the future outcomes. And to summarize, those carryover effects exist due to that uh, the past actions, they can affect the distribution of the drivers, which can in turn affect the future outcome. Uh, but, but as I have mentioned earlier, uh, most of the existing uh, A-B testing procedures, they will fail uh, to detect the carryover effects. So now to elaborate, uh, let us consider uh, very simple uh, toy example uh, where we focus on considering 
uh, the following pair of uh, the testing hypothesis. So under the now hypothesis, the old policy has larger cumulative reward. And under the alternative hypothesis, the new policy has larger cumulative reward. And uh, we further design two examples here. So in the first example, all those observations, they are dependent over time. So, so the carryover effect that does not exist in the first example. And in particular, uh, the immediate, uh, the, the, the outcome at each time point depends only on uh, the ST at this time point and uh, the, the, the current treatment where, where, where all those time varying variables, they are independently generated. So there's no carryover effect in this example. However, if we look at uh, the second example, so here, the current outcome is not, uh, doesn't depend on the current action, but it depends on the actions in the past through the current time varying variable ST. So in the second example, those observations, they are dependent over time and the carryover effects do exist in the second example. Now, given these two examples, we apply a very simple two, uh, sample t-test and a double machine learning based test uh, for causal effects evaluation, as well as our proposed test uh, to these two uh, examples. And it turns out that uh, when applied to the first example, where no carryover effect exists, where the observations, they are time independent, so all these three tests, uh, they are very powerful. However, uh, when applied to the second example where the carryover effects does exist and the observations, they are time dependent. So neither the two sample T -set test nor the double machine learning based test, they are able to detect the alternative hypothesis. And to the country, uh, the proposed test remains very powerful. And next, uh, I would like to I'll give you a summary of the contributions and the advances of our proposal. So firstly, and uh, very importantly, uh, we introduced a reinforcement learning framework for solving the A-B testing problem. And as I will uh, discuss uh, later, so this uh, reinforcement learning framework is a very natural framework to be considered for those two-sided marketplace that involves sequential decision-making over time. And there's a number of advantages why we want to use uh, the reinforcement learning framework. So firstly, uh, just to remind you that uh, our objective here is to compare the long-term rewards, the long-term outcomes between two different policies. And in reinforcement learning, there's a very natural criteria to measure the long-term outcomes, which corresponds to the value function. And secondly, under this reinforcement learning framework, it turns out that uh, it allows us to directly model the carryover effects using the dynamic system transitions. So this uh, simultaneously address the first challenge. And finally, uh, it also enables us uh, to consistently estimate the long-term rewards, even if we are given a single time series data. And I will talk about uh, these three uh, points uh, in detail uh, later in the next few slides. And in addition, uh, we also propose uh, an original test procedure for comparing the long-term rewards between different policies. And there are three novelties of our proposed test procedure uh, involves sequential monitoring, online updating, and it is also applicable to a wide range of the designs. So including the Markov design, the alternating time interval design, and the adapted design. So this helps to address the second and the third challenge. Now let's first uh, uh, focus on uh, the first bullet point where we introduce a reinforcement learning framework for A-B testing. And in particular, I will focus on talking about uh, the following two uh, questions. So firstly, uh, what is the reinforcement learning framework? And secondly, why do we want to use the reinforcement learning framework? So 
So firstly, I just want to uh, give you a brief introduction uh, to reinforcement learning. Uh, so basically, uh, reinforcement learning is concerned with solving the so-called sequential decision-making problems. And it is typically assumed that there exists an agent that tries to learn and interact with a given environment. And at each time point, the agent will observe some features from the environment summarized into a state vector. And then the agent will choose some actions from uh, the, 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 the set of available uh, options. And after that, the environment will respond to the agent by providing an immediate reward to the agent. And in addition, the environment will move into the next, uh, into the future uh, state based on the action that the agent selected. And such a procedure applies sequentially. So at the end, the agent will receive a sequence of the rewards. And one of the uh, key objective of reinforcement learning is try to find an optimal policy to maximize the cumulative reward that the agent receives in the long run. And the reinforcement learning has also been widely applied uh, in uh, a number of applications. So, uh, uh, and in the last few years, I guess one of the most successful application of those reinforcement learning algorithms corresponds uh, to uh, the, the development of AlphaGo, uh, which is the AI system invented by the Google DeepMind team. And five years ago, it successfully defeated the uh, who was the final boss of the game of Go at the time. And here in this slide, I list some of the existing state-of-the-art reinforcement learning algorithms to solve those sequential decision-making problems. But what I want to highlight in this slide is that the foundations of all those reinforcement learning algorithms lie in modeling the observed data by a so-called Markov decision process model. And there are two key assumptions behind this such an MDP model. So the first assumption is a Markov assumption, so which intuitively means that uh, conditional on the present, the future, and the past, they are independent. And in particular, it requires uh, the future uh, state and uh, the current outcome to be independent of the past uh, data observations given the current state action pair. And the second assumption basically corresponds to the stationarity assumption. And uh, it essentially requires that this Markov transition function, or this Markov transition density function should be stationary over time. Now, by introducing uh, this reinforcement learning framework, we essentially mean that we use this Markov decision process model to model the observed data to formulate the A-B testing problem. And here's a graphical visualization of the Markov assumption. Uh, so given the current state action pair, the uh, outcome and the future state, they are independent of the observations in the past. So they are independent of the past uh, data history. And here's a visualization of the stationarity assumption. So essentially uh, those parallel sign means that uh, uh, the the uh, effect of those variables on uh, the, the outcomes, they are stationary over time. So, so those uh, effects, they are time homogeneous. Now, uh, the second question, why we want to use the reinforcement learning framework. So as I had mentioned earlier, uh, our purpose is to compare the long-term rewards between two different policies. And in reinforcement learning, there's a very natural criteria that we can use to measure the long-term rewards, which corresponds to the value function. And uh, specifically, uh, the value function is defined uh, to be the conditional expectation of the cumulative discounted rewards given uh, under a given uh, initial state. Uh, so here, uh, the expectation is taken by assuming that uh, one particular treatment is repeatedly assigned. 
And the discounted factor gamma uh, is bounded between zero and one, and it represents a trade-off between the immediate and the future rewards. And when gamma is small, uh, we put more weight on the immediate reward. And in the most extreme case where we set gamma to be equal to zero, it leads to a myopic evaluation. And to the country, uh, if we increase the value of gamma, then we pay more and more attention to the future rewards. And when gamma is close to one, uh, it leads to far-sighted evaluation. Now, the second reason why we want to use the reinforcement learning framework is that it allows us to model the carryover effects using the dynamic state transitions. So here's a causal diagram of uh, the uh, MDP model and based on this causal diagram, we can see that uh, there's a pass from the past action to the current reward, to, to, to the current outcome. So there's a pass here connecting these two variables. And essentially, under this model assumption, the past treatment, the past action is allowed to impact the current reward indirectly through its effect on the current state variable, so on the current uh, time varying variable ST. And in practice, what it implies is that uh, those ST, they should include important mediators that mediates the treatment effects of the past actions on the uh, current outcomes. And to the country, uh, most of the existing uh, works in the A-B testing procedure, they require the independence assumption. So this is their uh, causal diagram. And because of that, uh, they cannot uh, be used uh, to capture the carryover effects. And finally, uh, by introducing the MDP model assumption, uh, it imposes the Markov assumption and the stationarity assumption. And these two assumptions allows us to consistently estimate uh, the long-term reward under a given policy, even if we have a single time series data. And these assumptions, they are also mild uh, to some extent. Uh, so for instance, we can always concatenate observations over multiple time points in order to meet the Markov assumption. And in order to meet the stationarity assumption, so in our application, we can create some dummy variables, so such as uh, peak and non-peak hours, and they include those dummy variables uh, in the state uh, to satisfy uh, the stationarity assumption. Uh, there's a question uh, in uh, Q and A. Uh, are you assuming that in your Markov formulation, the equations are linear? Uh, if that, uh, that's right, can you justify it for this application? Uh, that's a very good question. So here we do not require those uh, equations to be linear. So we allow it uh, to be uh, nonlinear uh, we allow it to be nonlinear, but, but later what we do is that we will uh, use C method uh, to, to handle the potential uh, nonlinear structure of this uh, Markov model. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, there's another question. Uh, would, would the MDP be a good framework here given there are other agents uh, leading to non-stationarity in the environment. Um, so what other agents are you referring to here? Uh, so, so, so here in this application, we consider, uh, we, we, we view this problem in a global uh, level. So, 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 so the platform only uh, implements one action at each time point. Um, uh, that, that, that's a very good question. Um, so, so here we mainly uh, focus on the, uh, the, the actions selected by the two-sided markets, by the uh, ride-sharing platform. And because of that, if we, if, we, uh, if we only focus on the actions determined by the uh, platform, then uh, there's only a single agent in our application. But, but of course, you can also do it as a, a uh, uh, you, you can also use a model framework to uh, formulate this problem by assuming that there's uh, multiple actions, uh, there are multiple agents in this application. But here, we only focus on the actions selected, determined by the uh, ride sharing company. And because of that, so there's only a single agent in our uh, application from this uh, perspective. 
Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, now, the second uh, contributions of our uh, work is that we propose a test procedure for comparing the long-term rewards of two policies. And as I have talked about earlier, uh, it has three normalities, including sequential monitoring on an updating, and it is applicable to a wide range of the designs. And here's a conceptual comparison uh, between our proposal and some of the existing uh, work. Uh, so uh, firstly, if we consider the two sample t-test, uh, so the very naive two sample t-test, so it, it requires the observations to be independent. So it cannot handle the carryover effects. And it is not designed for solving the sequential testing problem. Uh, but it can be applied to the switchback design, uh, which is the design uh, under our real data application. Now, if we consider a classical uh, sequential test, uh, they also require the independence assumption. So they cannot handle the carryover effects. Uh, but uh, they allow sequential monitoring, they allow early stopping, and they can be applied uh, in the, to the switchback design. And the reason uh, there's also a paper by uh, Boynoff and Shepard uh, where they uh, propose to evaluate uh, the treatment effect of uh, a policy in a trading company. And uh, in their paper, they focus on the long-term rewards so they can handle uh, the carryover effect. Uh, however, a sequential monitoring is not considered in their paper and they use inverse propensity score weighted method. And because of that, they require the propensity score to be bounded between zero and one. However, uh, in our application, we use a switchback design where the treatments, they are, they, they are deterministically assigned. And because of that, their method is not applicable to the switchback design, uh, which is the design considered in our application. And in addition, uh, here I also list uh, two uh, methods developed in the reinforcement learning literature. So we can adopt these two methods to test uh, the difference uh, between uh, two policies. Uh, so both, uh, both, both methods, uh, they, they consider long-term rewards, so they are able uh, to detect the, the carryover effects, but, but they haven't studied uh, the sequential monitoring uh, problem. And uh, they also require uh, to use the inverse propensity score weighted estimator, so they cannot be applied to the switchback design. And, and to the country, uh, for our proposal, uh, it is able to detect the carryover effect and we allow sequential monitoring and it can be applied, it can be applied uh, to the switchback design. And, uh, next, uh, uh, brief summary of the uh, methodology of our uh, proposal. So in order to compare the long-term rewards under two different policies, so we apply, uh, we propose to apply uh, the classical uh, temporal difference learning method uh, in uh, the reinforcement literature and then combine it with a C method uh, to compute the value estimator. And here I want to highlight that most of the, the existing uh, methods in the, temp, uh, in the reinforcement learning literature, uh, most of those uh, temporal difference learning methods, they focus on providing the point value estimator. Uh, but in our application, since uh, we want to conduct a hypothesis testing, uh, so we, want to, we need to provide the rigorous uncertainty quantification. And here I adopt uh, the method uh, proposed in one of my uh, recent GSSB paper. And the second key uh, ingredient in our uh, proposal is to adopt the alpha spanning approach that is originally designed for uh, clinical trials for sequential monitoring. And in addition, we also uh, develop a bootstrap assisted procedure for determining the stopping boundary. And this is because uh, the, for the classical alpha spanning approach, it uses the numerical integration method. However, such a method is no longer applicable in adaptive design due to the existence of the carryover effects in our application. And here's an illustration of uh, the alpha spanning approach. Um, so, so essentially, uh, in order to implement those alpha spanning approach, it requires to specify an alpha spanning function, uh, which is a function of the time uh, in the experiment. And typically, at the initial time point, uh, the, this function uh, is equal to zero. And at the end, uh, when the experiment is terminated, uh, then this function uh, is, 
equal uh, to uh, the total significance level, uh, the total uh, type one error, which is equal to, for instance, uh, 0.05. And it is required that this uh, alpha spanning function should be a monotonically increasing function. Now, suppose if we want to conduct a uh, sequential testing, so we want to uh, apply our test at three time points. So at time point T1, T2, and T. So this is how uh, the procedure looks like. So first day, uh, we collect all the data up to time point T1 and apply our test once. Now, instead of using all the uh, significance levels, we will only set, uh, we will set the significance level to be uh, equal to alpha T1 only. And then uh, if the test is rejected, then uh, we can terminate the experiment. Otherwise, we will need to conduct, uh, we need to collect the data again until the time point T2 and apply our test again. And due to that, we have already uh, used, uh, set the significance level to be uh, alpha T1 in the first time point. So here, when applying the test the second time, we will need to use uh, the incremental uh, significance level by setting this uh, alpha to be equal to the difference between alpha T2 and alpha T1. And again, uh, if the test is rejected, then we can terminate the experiment. So otherwise we will need to uh, wait until the end and apply the test again. Uh, so this is a uh, illustration of uh, the alpha spanning approach. And uh, in theory, we also show that our test is able to control the type one error and is consistent against the alternative hypothesis that converges uh, to the null at a parametric rate. And, and uh, it is uh, valid under uh, the Markov design, the alternative time interval design and the adaptive design. And, and more importantly, uh, in our proposal, uh, we propose to uh, use the temporal difference learning method and then combine it with the skew method to, de uh, to derive uh, the value estimator, to estimate the long-term effect of a given policy. And very importantly, we showed that under smoothing is not needed to guarantee the resulting value estimator have a tractable limiting distribution. So in other words, we do not need to include a huge number of basis functions to guarantee that the bias of the value estimator is much smaller compared to its standard deviation. And in addition, we also showed that the value estimator is semi-parametrically efficient. Now, the reason why under smoothing is not needed here is due to that uh, the CV estimators of conditional expectations, they are idempotent. And these results, they have already been established in the classical regression setting where the observations, they are time independent. And, and here we extend these results to our setting, to our setting of reinforcement learning, allowing the observations to be time dependent. And what it implies is that uh, the proposed test will not be over sensitive to the uh, number of basis functions and the cross validation can be potentially employed to select the basis functions. And finally, uh, we uh, conduct some simulation studies to compare our proposed test with a two sample T test and uh, a, a version of the uh, sequential test. And uh, it turns out, uh, so if you look at uh, the plot on the right, so this corresponds to the settings under the null hypothesis. So the blue line here uh, denotes the alpha spanning function and the gray line uh, depicts uh, the empirical rejection probability. So under the null, we expect that the gray line should be close to the blue line or it should be uh, well below the blue line. And it can be seen that uh, uh, all these tests, uh, they are able to control the type one error. Uh, however, if we look at the right plots, so those uh, plots correspond to the settings under the alternative hypothesis, then it can be seen that uh, neither the two sample t-test nor uh, the sequential, uh, classical sequential test, they are able to detect the alternative hypothesis. And to the contrary, uh, our test uh, remains very powerful. And, and again, this is due to that uh, those two competing methods, they are not able to detect the carryover effects. And finally, uh, we apply our test to uh, data from uh, the ride sharing company. And the data is uh, collected from a, a given uh, online experiment uh, that lasted for two weeks. And we use 30 minutes as one uh, time unit. And this gives us a total sample size of over uh, 600. And we include three state variables. So in, uh, including the number of drivers, number of call orders. And then we also include the supply and demand equilibrium matrix so which corresponds to a mediator that I had mentioned earlier that mediates 
the treatment effect of the past actions on the future outcomes. And we focus on comparing uh, two policies and the driver's income is set uh, to be the immediate reward at each time point. And the new policy is expected to have better uh, performance. And then we apply our test uh, to two uh, examples. So in the first uh, example, so this data is collected from an AA experiment, which compares a baseline strategy against itself. So since the treatment, since the policy is being considered, they are essentially the same. So we expect that our test should not reject the null hypothesis. And the blue line here corresponds to the rejection boundary and the uh, orange curve corresponds to a test statistic. So it can be seen that uh, the rejection boundary, uh, it, it, the, the value of the rejection boundary is much larger compared to the test statistic. So our test fails to reject the null hypothesis as expected. However, we applied our test procedure to the AB experiment. It turns out that we are able to claim that it can come, uh, the new policy is better before the experiment is terminated. And to the country, uh, if we directly use uh, the two sample t-test, then it fail to reject uh, the null hypothesis. Uh, it gives us a p-value of 0.18. Uh, there's, a, there, there, there's a few questions uh, in Q&A. Uh, so firstly, uh, can you control the time interval in the switchback design? Uh, will the results be better or worse if you can or cannot? Um, so if I understand the, uh, the question uh, correctly, uh, so, so here uh, we can uh, determine like uh, uh, when we would like to test in the switchback design. Uh, so, so essentially uh, in our data application, uh, what we will do is that uh, we will conduct our test at the end of the first week, as well as uh, every day on the second week. So, so in our application, uh, we can control our when to when to test uh, in, uh, under the switchback design, and uh, for 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 your second question, uh, will the result be better or worse if you cannot? So so I expect that if 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 I don't know, uh, when when shall we conduct the test? So this can be a more challenging problem. Um, so so I'm not sure about uh, the exact solution to your question, but I guess uh, if it, it, it will be challenging, it will be more challenging compared. Uh, to our current setting where we know uh, when to test. Hey, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. We're slowly running out of time. Could we maybe like try to wrap up in the next like three or four minutes and then we take some of the remaining question at the very end? Um, yeah, sure, no, no, no problem. Uh, so, so, so sorry for uh, the inconvenience. Um, so, um, I just want to quickly uh, summarize the second project where we de develop a deep delay device procedure uh, for all policy interval estimation. And the objective here is to evaluate the impact of the target policy offline using historical data generated by a different behavior policy, as well as to provide the rigorous uncertainty quantification. And here similarly, we also consider a reinforcement learning framework. And the key difference is that in the first project, we consider to evaluate the difference between two fixed policies. But in this project, we focus on uh, evaluating uh, the impact of a general target policy. And most of the existing methods uh, in the uh, reinforcement literature, they focus on providing point estimators. And uh, here, uh, we want to provide the rigorous uncertainty quantification to provide, uh, to construct confidence intervals. And the main idea is to develop a deep delay device procedure by using a theory of high order inference functions. And here's a graphical vi visualization of our procedure. So essentially for each of the estimator, there's a bias variance trade-off. And if our purpose is to provide a point estimator only to, to minimize uh, the mean square error, then we should guarantee the bias and virus, they, they can't like reach a balance. But, but in our application, since we focus on providing confidence intervals, since we focus on providing uh, uncertainty quantification, so we need to guarantee that the bias of the estimator is much, decays at a much faster rate compared to its virus, okay, compared to its standard deviation. And it turns out that uh, after applying our debiasing procedure multiple times, so it guarantees that uh, the bias of the final value estimator will be much smaller compared to its standard deviation. And because of that, uh, the resulting confidence interval is valid. So that's uh, the essential method. Oh, the, 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 the essential method of our proposal to iteratively debias the bias of the initial Q estimator.
And we also showed that our test is robust, is efficient and flexible. And we did some uh, conceptual comparisons and also conducted simulations to compare our test with uh, our uh, against our uh, proposal. And uh, I guess I, I can just uh, wrap up today. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. And the papers and software can be found on my personal website. And uh, finally, just a tiny advertisement. I have a postdoc position. So if you are interested, you can find uh, more information here. So again, uh, thank you very much. And feel free to let me know if you have any questions. All right, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I think uh, because of time constraints, we should probably just continue with the discussion and take all the other questions that we have at the very end of the seminar. All right, yeah, now we have the discussion by, uh, by Will. Uh, Will, whenever you're ready. All right, can you see the slides? Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for the uh, thanks for the uh, kind of invitation from the uh, online causing inference committee, and uh, thanks Chun for the invitation. And this is a, a discussion uh, of Chun Chun's work, as especially related to the work Chun Chun mentioned, the uncertainty quantification in the IO framework. So, and I want to discuss to one related work that's very related to Chun Chun's work. So. The, which focus on the online bootstrap inference for policy evaluation in RL. Typically, the idea is very similar to what Central mentioned. So in, in the online A-B test framework, in order to do online A-B test, we will need to first quantify the uncertainty in the estimator. So after we quantify uncertainty, we estimate the variance and then we construct the confidence interval, and then we can do the online A-B test. Okay. So in this uh, framework, this is the inference for policy evaluation in reinforced learning, and these two are children's work. So they typically require a batch update instead of fully online. So this is well justified in children's application because in the ride sharing application, so we set the time points at one day, like seventh day and eighth day and the ninth day. And between day and day, we have lots of data sets. So we can do a batch update. All right, so what is the motivation of this work is what happens if we would like to do online inference? We would like to uh, quantify the uncertainty for each decision we are making in this R framework. And in the linear stochastic approximation framework, there are some on, uh, existing work which focus on the ID setting or the martingale setting. So that's to say our data, our ID, or our data from a mind-based sequence. So basically the asymptotic normality results are well behaved and then we can construct the uh, inference by using plug-in estimator. So what's the motivation of this work is to, to develop a fully online inference for the linear stochastic approximation under the Markov noise. And where the, ten, the temporal difference learning, which is for on policy, and the gradient temporal difference learning, which is the off policy measure, are the special case of these two. And then construct the conflict intervals. All right. So, so uh, a few background about linear stochastic approximation. So, in linear stochastic, learning, the goal is to solve this linear system A bar C dot equals B bar. And, and here, so, and the update of this linear stochastic system is this on top of that, and where the alpha t is a linear rate, and c dot is the updated parameter. A tilde and b tilde, that's just noisy observation of the a bar and b bar. For example, in the uh, data-driven decision-making case, we don't observe a bar by b bar, right? instead we only observe a noisy version. And here, noisy version, uh, a function of uh, a courtesy Markov chain. Okay. And this firmware, this is a typical case of linear stochastic approximation on the Markov noise. And, and, and interesting, there are two special cases. One is the own policy linear TD, linear temporal difference learning. So in linear temporal difference learning, just like uh, what Chen Chen mentioned, so if we can parameterize the value function as a linear function of the state, then we have a parameter theta, and the goal eventually is to learn the theta in the update. And this linear TD is happened to be a special case of this framework. 
And in the second part of Chen Chun's work, he mentioned uh, off policy learning, where you don't observe, you don't, you cannot interact with the environment. So, and the off policy, the gradient TD, that's another uh, widely used uh, of policy measures. This is also a special case of this framework. All right. And why is the inference is challenging in especially under Markov setting? So. If we can, re if we reformulate this update a little bit, basically we can write down the set update as a function of the previous update plus a noise term. Here, the key part is this noise term, where ET is a martingale difference sequence noise. So this is well behaved. And we have two additional terms. These two additional terms are decaying noise. This goes to zero eventually. And in the ID setting or in the Martingale setting, we don't have the remaining two parts. We only have the first one. And then we can use plugin estimator to estimate the variance of the sequence by the asymptotic anomaly results. And then we can construct company in the world and do online A-B test. Okay. However, in the, Mar in the Markov noise setting, we have two remaining terms. So we cannot simply plug in to, we can not simply use plug-in estimator for the variance, okay? So that's the key difference between this work and the tensions, the tensions measure. Tensions, they, uh, they use the best temporal difference learning, which is a least square temporal difference learning. So where you don't have this bias issue. Okay? All right, so that's the key difference. We cannot use plug-in estimator to estimate the variance. So that's why in this work, we'll propose a bootstrap version. So the idea is a very simple. So like uh, in bootstrap, we multiply a perturbation W to the sequence. And this W is ID random variable with mean one and a variance one. And this is independent of X, okay? And after we multiply this W, we can keep track of this new sequence. So this C dot T hat, that would be a new sequence. And in theory, we show that this new sequence have the same distribution to the original point estimate that we are interested in. Okay. So by this theory, and then eventually what do we need to do, just use the distribution of the left term to estimate the distribution of the right term. Right, right term. Okay. And then eventually what do we do is just use bootstrap to estimate the distribution of left term we can generate many, many W at each time T. And then we generate many sequence of theta hat. And then we can use the variance of this theta hat to approximate the variance of left-hand side. And then eventually we can get to the confidence interval for the right-hand side term. So that's the key idea of the online bootstrap inference. In here, we can um, prove that this construct and the quantum interval are asymptotically valid in the sense that when t goes to infinity and when the bootstrap uh, numbers goes to infinity, all these co construct quantum interval are valid. Okay, so that's the first part I would like to mention. That's related to Chen Shun's work. In Chen Shun's work, as LSTD, that's the least square temporal difference where you can batch update your, uh, your, your reinforced learning algorithm in policy. Uh, in some application, for example, in self driving car application or in real time recommender system, you will want to construct the counter interval at each decision point. So, and for that kind of task, we can use this online push reinforce format. Okay, so that's the first one I would like to mention. So, the second part of uh, interest work is an uh, extension of Chen work is how can offline data help the online A/B test? So in the current uh, Chen Chun's work has focused on the online A/B test where we just do online experiments. And this is great in practice, and this is very uh, accurate, and there's no unobserved co-founding issues in the online A/B test, but sometimes this could be expensive, the online experiment. And this may also hurt user experience, especially in some recommender system or in some clinical trials. Uh, for example, in the switchback at design, so we have to force the customer to get to the treatment A or get treatment B. So that's the, uh, that may hurt the user experience. So interest work, interest work is how to use the offline data to help the decision. So for the offline data, we have plenty of offline data. 
and the uh, and the issue of this offline data is they may have some unobserved co-founding co-founding issues because they are from another design. So this, for example, so in the clinical trial in the current like a COVID vaccine design. So at the beginning of the vac new vaccine design, there's no existing data. What scientists can do is to look at the historical vaccine design data set or clinical trials. And the based on data may have some sense of what the treatment design is for the online evidence. Okay. And uh, some open question is how to use the offline data to help the, the extreme design. For example, should we use the switchback design in the online app test or what kind of treatment should we design in the online app test? So this might be, uh, the, if we have plenty of, plenty of offline data, this could help in this sense. Second one is how to use offline data to improve the sample efficiency in the online A-B test. In online app test, we have to construct confidence in the world. We have to estimate variance. In order to estimate that, we typically need lots of data sets. So how can we use the plenty of offline data to do this or to help improve the sample efficiency? So that's something that's interesting. Okay, I think that's that's all of my discussion. Thank you very much for the uh, for having me here. Uh, th thanks. Uh, thanks, Wei, uh, for, for, for the very uh, nice discussion. Uh, so just uh, want to make a few comments regarding uh, your, your, your discussion. Uh, so the first part, you introduced the online bootstrap uh, inference method. And uh, I think uh, it, it can be naturally applied in our application. Uh, so the advantage of using uh, your method is that uh, it allows us to test uh, like at each time point. At each time point, we can conduct the test uh, based on your method. So uh, this potentially helps to uh, terminate the experiment earlier. Uh, but but to, uh, to, to the country in our application, we only focus on conduct the test each day. So, so that's why uh, we can do it uh, in an offline uh, setting uh, as you have mentioned. But uh, I think your method can be potentially used to, 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 to help uh, in, in, in our applications. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the second uh, question on how to combine offline and the online data, it is also uh, equally very, very, very interesting. And uh, for, for those companies, and uh, they usually have a huge uh, observational data for the past app policy. So, so actually we already have lo lo lots of data, historical data uh, for, for, for the old policy. So this is because usually we, we will definitely use the old policy in the past. Now, now the, the, the problem is that as you have mentioned uh, in the online testing, in the A-B testing procedure, uh, how, how shall we design, uh, the, the, the design this experiment uh, to utilize the offline data to, 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 to conduct the test uh, more in, in a more efficient manner. So, so, so that's a, um, I, I think this is a very interesting uh, question and uh, we, 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 we can maybe uh, explore further uh, on how to, how, how to do uh, this, to do, to do uh, these related uh, future works. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you for the comments. All right, thanks. So, I mean, we still have like a tiny bit of time left so you can take a few quick questions from Q&A uh, if, you, if you want to take some. <laughs> No, but we can also we can also wrap up if you're. Yeah, maybe maybe just one quick question. Uh, I saw there's a question uh, on Q and a what what additional benefit can be introduced by offline data when compared to, uh, the offline uh policy method. Uh, so this is a very good question. And uh, I think uh, of course you can you can treat all the data as an offline data and then apply our offline, uh, evaluation methods, but uh, the offline data firstly it might suffer from a compounding issue. So by conduct, conducting the online experiment, uh, you, render, you randomly generate the treatment. So it guarantees that uh, uh, it doesn't have any co-founder, unmeasured co-founders in the observed data. So, so the treatment effect can be uh, precisely evaluated. But in the country, if we only use uh, the offline data, then it might suffer from the compounding issue. And the second reason uh, why uh, the online uh, design of experiment is uh, considered the, 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 the design of experiment is uh, Good idea is that uh, it also helps to improve the efficiency of the treatment uh, of the uh, causal effect estimator. So if we if we design the experiment properly, we can guarantee that uh, the test can might, might have better power property. And um, there's a follow-up question: Why offline data would potentially introduce the unbiased co-founding issue? Uh, so this is because um, in, in some applications, uh, for instance. Um, we, we human might decide uh, which, which action to take at each time point. 
and uh, we, we take actions might, might due to some, some unobserved factors. So, uh, but for those factors, they are not recorded in our observed data set. So, 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 so in the offline data set, uh, uncompounding is a very serious issue and uh, we need to take that into consideration. All right, I think I'll now quickly wrap up for one second. So first, thank you so much, uh, Cheng Cheng, for a very interesting uh, talk and uh, for, for, a, for a very nice discussion. Um, next time, we're going to have a talk by Matthias Sturton uh, from the Technical University of Munich, who will talk about the half-track criterion for identifiability of latent variable models. Thank you all for uh, checking in today. I hope you have a great week and uh, see you next time. All right. Thank you. Thank you.